है Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar this evening, uh, The Frog King, Seeing Images, Image Dynamics in Clinical Work. My name is Mark Dean. I'm a licensed professional counselor and art psychotherapist. I'm also an analytic training candidate with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes getting us oriented. I have a good deal of material it's fairly text heavy and it's fairly um, dense in some of its content, but I'm hoping it will be a, a very valuable experience for you and you'll get some good information out of it. The material that I'm presenting uh, is material that's very much grounded in the kind of clinical work that I do and I think um, uh, can really enhance your practice. Um, what we're going to be doing is initially I'm going to be talking uh, just a bit about what I'm going to be doing and what I'm not going to be doing. And one of the things I'm not going to be doing is trying to set up a situation where I'm indicating that this fairy tale is a, a sort of a template for you to do clinical work. That's not my interest at all. What my interest is in using the fairy tale as an example of an image construct I'll explain more about that later. Um, that will be uh, exemplify, that will exemplify uh, certain qualities or certain aspects of the image world. The first part that I'm going to get involved with is a little bit of a philosophical point of view and to lay out some groundwork as to why I believe this is essential in any clinical work. And there's a good deal of evidence that says that it is and that in fact it is the core of clinical work. Um, we are broadcasting from the Center of Psyche for Psyche and the Arts. Uh, that is my wife Michelle Dean and myself, our practice and our organization. And uh, it is focused primarily on that very task of helping people to understand the value and the importance of imagery and image dynamics in psychological work. Uh, this is the uh, this is the property we're in. It's a little bit of a fairy tale structure itself, as you can see. It's a great old house with a lot of history. I'd like to begin with uh, this quote from uh, Goethe. He says, "We have eyes because there is light." That sounds a little bit like a very simplified notion, and in fact, it really points to a complex phenomenon. What he's pointing to is the fact that both eyes and light form an organismic relationship with one another. In fact, they are very deeply linked to one another, and one does not go without the other. So what we're talking about here is a mode of perception, a mode of understanding has a particular phenomenon to which it's related, and it's intimately related to that. So we can ask ourselves the question, if in the physical way, there is a, a deep connection between our capacity to see things and a specific phenomena to which that pertains. To what phenomena does the human imagination pertain? To what phenomena do our inner images pertain? The little map that I have here on the screen is one that I use to talk about this. Let me do a little explaining because we're going to spend some time with this image. This blue area that you see here is uh, consciousness, the capacity to see and to understand. The red area in the middle here is really the ego. Carl Jung said the ego was the sensing apparatus of the psyche. So the ego was not the entirety of the psyche. It was the sensing, seeing, understanding part of the psyche. The entire psyche includes both unconscious elements, which you see in all the black, and also the conscious elements. And it also includes an external world and an internal world. Um, this is Sayed Hussain Nasser in a lovely little book called Man and Nature, written in 1998. Uh, Nasser is a, uh, a scholar of Islamic studies, actually. I think he's at Columbia. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't really know where he is now. But at any rate, it's a lovely book. And he's making the same statement in, in, a, in a verbal sense that I just showed you in, in an imagistic uh, construct. 
He says, man stands, in fact, between the spiritual and material creations and partakes in the nature of both. In him, the whole creation is contained in an essential rather than in a material or substantial sense. What Nasser's talking about is that we're made not only of external reality, but we also have an internal reality. And this is essential for us to understand if we're going to be looking at issues of a psychological nature. Uh, this is a, a quote of Henry Corbin in Tom Cheatham's book. Tom Cheatham's book is The World Turned Upside Down. Um, and uh, he, he quotes Corbin. Henry Corbin is another scholar of Islamic studies. And what he's doing is he's quoting, I believe um, he's pointing to an 11, uh, in the 1100s, uh, a man by the name of Suravardi, who was an Islamic philosopher. And these ideas go way back. And what he's saying is the visible aspect of a being presupposes its equilibration by an invisible and celestial counterpart. The apparent and exoteric, meaning the outer, is equilibrated by the occulted and esoteric, meaning the inner. What he's saying here, and we'll have a, a visual image of this in a few minutes, is that the outer world and the inner world uh, share a kind of a dialectical relationship so that what's outer is affected by what's inner. It's changed by it in terms of what we see and also how we see it, how we understand it. And it also goes back into us and becomes the contents, the raw contents, for the image world that organizes our interior life. So here we have it once again. What is out here in the external world is of one nature, the internal world of a different nature, but essentially these two worlds essentially have a unity with one another, even though modally, in terms of the mode of perception, they're entirely different in nature. That is a good deal of what I'm trying to focus on tonight. What is the internal construct? How does the internal world, world organize itself? This is a matter, I believe, uh, that, that very important in psychological work. Uh, Thomas Nagel is a philosopher uh, who, uh, I think he still is at New York University, um, who takes up the issue of what we commonly call the mind-body problem. Uh, I'm not exactly sure that I think that that's a good description of that problem, but what he's really talking about is that the methodology appropriate to one aspect of our experience is not appropriate to the other aspect of our experience. Here he says, conscious subjects and their mental lives are inescapable components of reality, not describable by the physical sciences. The resources of the physical sciences are not adequate for this purpose because these resources were developed to account for a data of a completely different kind. Now, if we think back about our uh, opening comment by uh, Goethe, he's saying, well, the mode of perception really relates to a phenomenon. So the outer circumstances or the physical sciences are really oriented toward describing physical phenomena. They're not adequate for describing uh, consciousness itself, which is a very different kind of phenomenon. That's the point that he's making. We are dealing with a gap of a totally different kind between the objective spatio-temporal order of the physical world and the subjective phenomenological order of experience. So what he's pointing to here is that, um, and it's not uh, page uh, exclamation mark three, it's page 13, the, uh, in the psychophysical nexus, what he's saying is, that these two different uh, worlds that we both that we participate in uh, continually um, actually uh, uh, um, are organized ac according to different ordering principles. Concepts can be objective in more than one way, but phenomenological concepts seem, in fact, to secure their objectivity through an internal connection to behavior and circumstances. What's this pointing to and what does this mean? Well, what he's saying is there isn't an, 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 uh, an external um, 
validating system for what is internal, the internal, the phenomenological aspect, the, 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 the aspect that uh, holds to the immediacy of experience actually organizes itself in such a way that it has an internal logic that it makes. So what I would like to offer is the notion that what we're about here tonight is the idea that the image world has an intrinsic logic. And in fact, each and every image has an intrinsic logical structure. And that is ongoing. What we're doing constantly is we're rebuilding that kind of construct within ourselves. But if we stop and we look at an instance of image, we'll begin to notice that it has its own kind of internal logic. That's what Nagel's pointing to here. Here we have a nice little um, uh, uh, model of it. And in, in what we're talking about is the mode of authentication in the external world. The physical sciences really predominate. External validation is a rational model, or it has to do with ratio. Ratio means divide. And in the external world, we understand things by their divisions, how things are different, how things are separated. However, in the internal world, just as Nagel said, it's really the internal coherence. It's more of a mythic model, and it's based on something we might call theoria. Now, I'm making this transition to theoria because essentially what's going on is a theory is essentially a, a, a kind of a constellation of elements that come to, together to make a specific logic that holds those relationships together. So the notion of the internal world is that its authenticity is not the sort of permanent, more permanent authenticity of external world. It's more the immediate authenticity of experience. It may have facts in it, but it isn't necessarily entirely composed of facts, nor is it really contingent on factuality. In fact, what we could say is it coheres to a fictive construct. What I mean by that is that at all times in the internal world, what's going on is that we are building sort of constructs. There's a continuity of constructs because we, we are sort of ongoing in our experience. Our experience flows in a stream. But it's important to understand that the way the internal world is constructed is very, very different than the external world, even though the same contents might be observed in both. Now, I'm going to shift gears here. And because we are talking about psychotherapy and we're talking about clinical work, that's what we're here for. Uh, not necessarily to talk philosophy, but I want to make the bridge here because essentially when you begin to look at a uh, psychotherapy outcome study, it really does point right back to what I've just been saying. Here's uh, Bruce Wampold, a very well-known researcher, uh, uh, the author of a number of books. The Basics of Psychotherapy is one, uh, put out by the American Psychological Association, and it's an opener to a whole series on psychological theory. But what he says here is there's no means to declare one theory is superior to another. However, theory is absolutely necessary to guide practice. What he's saying is that in the psychotherapy process, one has to have some sort of guiding structure. I would like to raise a question about that, not to challenge it, because I think he's accurate in that. But the question that I would raise is this, is the theory or the story, in other words, the fictive construct, necessarily one that we impose upon our patient, or is it one that we actually find in the encounter? I think that that's really what, um, what we need to be asking ourselves. And I think in analytic work in specific, uh, there's an emphasis, at least in the Jungian school, of putting a great deal of emphasis on the idea that what's happening in the encounter is a structure in the process of self-making. And so the theory isn't something that we get from outside and place on the clinical situation. It's something that we see arising within the clinical situation. And in order to do that, we have to be able to understand those structures that go into making that kind of construct. 
Here's Wampold again. And these, his books are excellent. I urge you all to read them. Uh, one is The Great Psychotherapy Debate, and the other is The Basics of Psychotherapy. He has another one called The Soul of Psychotherapy. Um, a really good researcher, very smart, and puts a lot of things together. I would say a good integral thinker. That an entity is unobservable does not detract from its usefulness. Uh, we fall into this because, in point of fact, um, uh, well, let me just give you a quick example. Uh, on Monday, I taught a, a class of beginning art therapy students. We had an art therapy evaluation up on the wall. Uh, what the artwork said, ultimately, was not represented directly by any of the images that the patient drew. And yet the students, in the space of about an hour, with really no prior experience, were able to come to the conclusion that something that the patient uh, quite obviously did not represent, did not want to have seen, was right there in the artwork. I knew the case, knew the patient, knew what was going on. And with just very few cues, they, the students were able to put it together. So that, that's a really interesting thing because it's not directly observable. It's actually something that is seen not because it's an entity in itself, because it's an invisible entity. In other words, it's a reality that doesn't have any actual physical body. It has its own logic, and we can observe it if we pay attention to the logic of the images. But the reality is there that it isn't directly represented. This is something of what uh, Wampold's pointing to here. So in here, the mode of authentication, once again, we have we can say that the, the, uh, we can authenticate a thing from external validation, meaning uh, I see it, you see it, he, she, and it sees it. We're all in consensus about what we're looking at out here. But in the internal world, it really has more to do with the internal logic of the phenomenon itself and how the elements cohere to make a kind of structure. The external world, once again, subject-object differentiation, meaning that the object that I'm looking at is different from me as I look at it. In other words, I'm separate, and that's meant to kept, be kept separate. That's the way the external world really organizes itself, or that our means of observing it, the most effective means of observing it and validating it, uh, spring from that kind of construct. However, in the internal world, it's really subject-object unity, meaning that the image or the phenomena is something that I take into myself, and it changes me, and I'm informed by it. And in this sense, it's a sphere of unity as opposed to a sphere of division. My job is to get closer to the phenomenon, closer to an understanding of it, through allowing it to enter into me and me to enter into it, and to try to understand its logic as it affects me. This is a very different notion from what we have in experimental science. Um, once again, these constructs that uh, I'm talking about are uh, fairly ubiquitous, actually. Once you begin to get into this material, you begin to find them just about everywhere. This is uh, uh, Yuasa Yusuo, and um, he writes a book called uh, Overcoming Modernity, Synchronicity, and Image Thinking. And he's really trying to get at this very same issue. Is uh, the cosmos really constructed uh, on a sort of a rational model, a physical model, or is it a much broader, uh, more imagistic model? And he, he, he comes to the conclusion it's the latter, as do I, so that the image structures are really what's holding uh, uh, experience together, what's holding um, our universe together from the point of view of an experienced phenomena, as opposed to a measured phenomena, which is a very different thing. I have some differences in his construct, but he's coming up with a very, very similar uh, kind of notion. Uh, this goes back to Jacob Bohm um, from about, what, 1500. Um, he comes up with a very similar kind of construct. One would call him a, a Christian mystic. And what's really interesting about this is the Christian mystics and the mystics in general really were involved in a deep sort of internal contemplation, understanding structures by delving into them, not standing apart from them, 
but delving into the experience and having a disciplined approach to observing. So it's really a very fascinating thing. The uh, esoteric studies, we're going to look at some esoteric studies people in just a second, and um, uh, are really plumbing this whole arena. What, what, you know, how, what are the principles by which we understand what's going on in the internal world? Another individual who's really interesting to get to know is Brian Goodwin. He's a biologist from Shoemaker College in England. And uh, because I don't have my presenter's notes here, I forget the woman that he cites in his book that came up with this construct. But essentially, this construct, this sort of duality of consciousness, the one process up on the top of defining and then the process on the bottom of relating was really uh, her thesis with regard to uh, Goethe's um, method of observation. Goethe, as you may well know, was uh, an accomplished scientist in addition to being uh, a giant of romantic poetry. So he was an artist and also a scientist, and his methodology really had to do with kind of bouncing back and forth between these two sort of processes of getting in relationship to phenomena, but also observing it. What is little known, um, and, and I think even poorly, more poorly understood, is uh, that Sir Isaac Newton also um, practiced alchemy. Uh, now, from the point of view of the scientist, he didn't get much from alchemy, but what he understood, I'm pretty sure, is that um, the kind of consciousness that can enter into a phenomena, which is what the alchemists did. Alchemy had to do not with subject-object differentiation, but observation of oneself in relationship to phenomena and feeling that phenomena and observing were part of one process. They weren't separate processes. So there wasn't this radical separation that you got in the Enlightenment where suddenly matter was separated out from consciousness. And, they, and, and Isaac Newton was very deeply involved in that. In fact, his esoteric writings far outstrip his scientific writings in volume. That's a very interesting uh, fact and a very interesting area of study. Now, I've been talking about these two image fields, and, and the reality is that these two image fields um, come together uh, quite naturally. What's happening on a constant basis is the outer world is moving inward and the in, inner world is moving outward and things are flowing in both directions. This is uh, Henry Corban. Sorry that uh, the sighting got cut off here. Uh, this is from Mundus Imaginalis. Um, Henry Corban was very influential with James Hillman. Some of you may know of that and know him. Um, but he says in Mundus Imaginalis, but an odd thing happens. Once this transition is accomplished, it turns out that this reality, previously internal and hidden, is revealed to be enveloping, surrounding, and containing what first of all, what was first of all external and visible since by means of interiorization, one has departed from external reality. That's a little cumbersome in some ways, but you know I get it, and I think I might be able to decode it a little bit. What he's saying is that the internal world is found not just to be internal, but once you begin to understand its contents, you understand that it's forming the structure of external observation. Let me give you a quick clinical example. A woman I saw the other day, comes in and tells me a story. She's a bit of a writer, and she says that she's uh, um, uh, thinking about doing some writing because this thing struck her. She saw this woman walking away from her in this store, and suddenly she had this thought that she could never catch this woman. And she thought that was kind of an interesting experience. Um, my question to her was really this. Um, what is it in yourself, or what image of a woman that you think maybe you need to catch up to, do you fear you never will catch up to? And of course, uh, she you know began to tear up. And of course, we hit pay dirt. Um, there was a, you know a, a good deal of her clinical issues had to do with that. Who who she believed she need to be needed to be, uh, but could never possibly get to be. And and in that encounter what you understand is that the incidental image seen in the outer world 
if the patient's bringing it in automatically is understood to be reflective of an inner stru- uh, um, inner 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 image structure. I'm going to turn again really quickly to the I Ching. Uh, for those of you who don't know the I Ching, the I Ching is the Chinese Book of Changes. It uh, is about 2,000 years before the current era that it began. And the idea of the uh, Book of Changes, it was an oracular text. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to go into the methodology, but what the way that the oracular text works was that you would get um, generate these hexagrams, and the hexagram would be composed of two trigrams, a lower trigram and an upper trigram. This is the upper trigram. This is the lower trigram. The lower trigram was understood to represent a picture of the inner world, and the upper trigram was to represent the outer world. Now, what is really fascinating about the Chinese viewpoint is that their conception of reality was not something that you're looking at, but something that you're in. And so the idea of the oracular text was to orient the um, inquirer as to what the situation that they're in was from the point of view of an inner construct and an outer construct. The idea was to figure out where you are in this much bigger thing that you're in that was composed both of the outer world and the inner world. And so as such, what they're doing is they're really inverting the Western viewpoint, or the Western viewpoint is a radical inversion of their viewpoint. The idea being that I am a small person in a situation, not looking at a situation, but in a situation, and I have to see it from within it. And this is Jung uh, in the I Ching. Um, uh, Wilhelm is the one that uh, wrote the I Ching and Baines interpreted it. And uh, listen to what he says. While the Western mind carefully sifts, weighs, selects, classifies, isolates, the Chinese picture of the moment encompasses everything down to the minutest nonsensical detail because all of the ingredients make up the observed moment. What's crucial? What's crucial about this observation is that from the point of view of the internal observation, all of the details matter because all the details make up, um, all these details make up, excuse me, all these details are making up the construct, which is this instant. So while the outer viewpoint of looking at things breaks things down into components, the inner viewpoint is trying to see how all the parts are related. Uh, And this is what I think is clinically really essential in your work. How is your experience affecting the field? This is why Jung and Freud stressed the transference and the countertransference, because they knew that if you're getting to the immediate moment of experience, the therapist is a part of that experience. And when you begin to look and get into this space of the immediacy of the moment with the patient, anything that's going on is part of the picture. It's part of what's going on. And this is why um, when we go to looking at the fairy tale, the goal isn't to create a template, but to really exercise a deeper awareness of being able to look at any image construct and begin to question, well, how is this put together? Well, how is this related to that? How do the parts go together? What is the logic driving this particular picture? Um, Arthur Verse Lewis is an esoterologist, uh, essentially a, a professor of esoteric studies, and he distinguishes three types of readers of text. Closed readers, those who come to a work with a predetermined thesis that disallows imaginative entry. Clinically, I would say that that's the person that already knows what they're looking at because they have a plan and because they have uh, a construct or they have a formula and they know how to put it on the situation. Two, sympathetic readers who enter into a work imaginatively, people who really can come in and connect to uh, what they're seeing. The third, he says, however, are initiates. And what he means is people who enter into the work as a mirroring process that they seek to undergo in themselves. 
Well, if we think about that clinically, what we're talking about is you enter into the work in a process that you know you're going to be changed in the process because you're actually going to become part of the structure of what's going on in that process. What we're talking about between one, two, and three is moving from the exterior of experience with the patient to the third place, which is an interior. I don't expect to be initiated by my patient in any way, but I do expect that when I enter into the process with my patient, I'm going to be as open to change as I expect them to be. And together, we are going to be in a unified space working together. Here's what this might look like. Uh, this is actually Harold Searles. And the um, Harold Searles, I don't have the um, reference here. I apologize for that. Uh, what he's talking about is this would be the first reader, the out of contact field. I'm looking at the phenomena as a thing. He says here, a complex discharging field. What does he mean by that? Well, he means that you and I are in contact, but we're really operating out of our two individual subjectivities. Um, you're bringing your very subjective view to the situation. I'm bringing my subjective view to the situation. We're having contact, but we're really operating out of our kind of predetermined constructs of who we are. The secure symbolizing field, interestingly enough, is that both you and I in the clinical encounter are both participating in a single structure, that something is going on that's constellating all of me and all of you that is relevant to its nature and to the process and drawing us into that process. We're now in the process to gather. Um, um, I'm trying to think of the name right now. Thomas Ogden um, says that that's when the analytic third shows up. And what he says is an image appears that actually represents that field right there. What's going on that, that is really the image of the intersection of both of these consciousnesses that are coming together. So uh, this is, uh, Jung was very, uh, uh, very much involved in looking at the alchemical text, and, the, and this is a representation, I think, in some ways, of what I was just referring to about the two uh, pairs uh, caught in the same um, space and mediated over by a higher principle descending down. That's a little bit complicated. I don't want to get into that too much because we could spend all night just with that. But what we're talking about is a structure in which the two parties in the, in the endeavor are both, in a way, making together the product, which is the therapeutic outcome. And it requires some degree of change by both of them I would say it needs containment, which is what we provide in the therapeutic situation. But it also needs a principle that's coming into the situation. And this principle isn't just the theory that you bring in and put on the situation, but it's one that arrives in relationship to the constellation of the situation itself. We're going to see some of that in a few minutes in the tale. Again, this issue, this is from the Splendor Solace which is an alchemical text. We see the outer world here, things are going on, but the inner world is a very, very, very different world. And so when I'm looking at my patients and I'm listening to them very carefully, I'm always thinking about how the outer situation and the inner situation connect with one another. Do they, uh, do they uh, counterbalance one another? Um, does uh, the inner world cast an image and find an image in the outside world, such as the woman that I just spoke of, in order to alert her to what her internal state was, of which she was entirely unconscious? Uh, it can happen in any number of ways, but I'm always given that some thought. When I listen to dreams, I'm always wondering about their relationship uh, to the rest of the outer life of the patient. When somebody's doing a drawing, I'm doing the same thing. So here we have that construct once again. Just wanted to leave that with you. This is Bruce Wampold, and here he's sort of nailing it down. If the medical model provides a useful framework for conceptualizing psychotherapy, then evidence should suggest that specific ingredients are responsible for the benefits of psychotherapy. Precious little evidence exists for this proposition. Why do I bring that in? 
because what he's saying de facto when you decode it is that psychological reality isn't functioning like physical reality. It doesn't work. To put that model on psychological reality doesn't work. To be sure, all kinds of physical things can change mood or can change thought or this and that, but the reality is that psychological uh, effect is not contingent necessarily on those things. Decades of psychotherapy research have failed to find a scintilla of evidence that any specific ingredient is necessary for therapeutic change. Again, what he's pointing out is that psychotherapy outcome studies really do not show that an external construct, a rational model, actually accounts for psychotherapy process, what happens there. It's a very different kind of construct, and he turns to the notion of the contextual model. Once again, a constellative or a constellating model in which a myriad of elements come together to create the effect. And the effect that is created isn't necessarily one that can be predicted necessarily. Uh, this is uh, Wolfgang Giegricht in The Soul's Logical Life, and hopefully we can get through this part really quickly. Uh, he points out the empirical clinical approach proceeds in exactly the wrong way and pursues system systematic alienation from itself. It turns directly to the outside facts accessible through scientistic and clinical observation. Psychology has to turn not just introspectively to the literal inside, but to the same outside facts that all the different sciences turn to, but via itself, be via its own in, um, center, its own internal notion. What he's saying there, in a little complicated way, is exactly what I've been trying to drive home. The internal element, the internal element to the situation, has its own authenticity because it pulls together a myriad of elements within its own. Um, framework and orchestrates that into a logical, cohesive construct. The reason that we need psychological theory in order to do psychotherapy, as Wampold said, is we need a, co a way to cohere the diverse elements into a viable image structure. Uh, Wampold also points out that that theory need not necessarily be scientifically true, meaning it need not be factual. And he alternates the, uh, the word um, um, theory with myth. So really, they're kind of operating in the same way, not that it's a literal myth, but that it operates in a mythic way. This is uh, uh, Evangelos Christu in the Logos of the Soul. Psychological experience, like dramatic experience, is observable only if the observer has participated in the event. That is to say, has registered the event as experientially meaningful to him. So he's now situating the psychotherapist in the middle of the situation as an experience phenomenon. This is Wampold again. With all of his research, this is what he boils it down to. The essence of therapy is embodied in the therapist. That's right in line with what I've been talking about. Essentially, it is an experiencing individual, not a set of data that makes psychotherapy go. Uh, we have kind of gone through that. Um, this is uh, Nagel once again, and here it seems clear in advance that no amount of physical information about the spatio-temporal order, the external order, will entail anything of a subjective phenomenological character. However much our purely physical concepts may change in the course of further theoretical development, they will always have been introduced to explain features of the objective spatio-temporal order and will not have implications of this radically different logical type. Essentially, what he's saying is it doesn't really uh, get to the logic of consciousness. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Um, what I'm going to be suggesting is that we have something of an image construct, an axis of image that the ego sees images outwardly, sees images inwardly. But in fact, that image construct is sort of circumambulating the entire process. Images are flowing into us from, from our inner world. Images are springing up. Images are coming in from the outer world. We're looking into the outer world selectively to see things based on how we're constructed internally. And those things from the outer world 
are being filed back into us as contents that elaborate our internal world. So this concept of these axes of image is what I'm talking about. And we're always looking to see, well, where in, in the scheme of things in this patient's life with the images that are arising, might we be situating such images? What, what is the nature of the image and how it's showing up? And what is its function? This is uh, Carl Jung. I realize this is a lot of text, so I hope you're able to hang in there. Um, the inner image is a complex structure made up of the most varied material from the most varied sources. It is no conglomerate, however, but a homogeneous product with a meaning of its own. What he's saying is that a lot of different factors constellate into something that has a meaning and also a function of its own. The image is a condensed expression of the psychic situation as a whole, and not merely, nor even predominantly, of the unconscious contents, pure and simple. In other words, conscious contents and unconscious contents, inner contents and outer contents, all go together to make up this internal image. It undoubtedly does express unconscious contents, but not the whole of them, only those that are momentarily constellated. Now, that implies that there's a kind of a magnetic process to these images, then they sort of self-form. Okay, now we're getting to our tale. In olden times when wishing still helped, as a lovely illustration of the frog getting down to the bottom of the well. And um, um, what's interesting about this beginning is it says in olden times when wishing still helped. Well, by invoking olden times, what it really does is it relativizes time. And the only place that time is really relativized isn't in the outer world, it's in the inner world. We can go back and forth in time in the inner world. We can imagine the future. We can imagine the past. We can remember the past. And, and well, we can't really do that necessarily with the outer world. We can't speed ahead. We can't go back. We're stuck in that moment. So already in the very beginning of this tale, what you're being invited into is the inner world. We could spend a good deal of time just talking about whether or not wishing still helped. There's a lovely line in uh, Wampold's research where he says, all psychotherapies studied proved to be helpful so long as they were intended to be helpful. Um, in, does it really matter what my internal intention is to the psychotherapy? Um, does the patient's intention to get better really matter? Is the wish to help important? Is the wish on the part of the patient to get better important? I would say it does. Uh, sitting around and wishing for something and expecting it to happen outwardly isn't really going to do a heck of a lot typically. But the wishing internally galvanizes a sort of an inner energy towards some goal. It may not materially move anything but it becomes crucially important in the process. So already we're kind of in an interesting kind of psychotherapy metaphor that we can use here, that the idea that the inner world is a very different place where time isn't really uh, necessarily ruling the roost, so to speak. What I'm gonna be talking about with the tale, uh, I'm gonna pick out four different kind of concepts here. One is teleology, the idea that an image form has its own teleology and that there's a teleology in the image form, meaning that it's intending to go somewhere. It, it's driving towards something. The second is polyvalence, the idea that every image is a multiple. The third is correspondences, that in the image world, it, uh, similarities and differences really matter. Um, in the example that I gave you of the woman who saw the woman walking away from her, there was a fairly clear correspondence between the image she was struck by outwardly and the image she was carrying around inside of herself, which she was not entirely aware of. The fourth is internal cohesion. And what I would say about that is what I've been saying, that internal cohesion is really the objectivity of the image world. In other words, how the parts fit together to form a singular expression. That expression may never be transferable to any other situation directly, but the internal cohesion is what really makes the image most powerful. 
Um, here's Nagel, the reference of the phenomenological term fixed then by the immediate phenomenological quality whose identification depends on its functional role. So what he's saying is we have a qualitative process and the qualities have functions. A given functional role might be occupied by different phenomenological qualities in different organisms, or conceivably there could be a system in which the same functional role was not occupied by a conscious experience at all. That last part's a little complicated, but what he's saying is in an image structure, you might have a frog, you may have an alligator, you may have a prince, you may have anything, and it may be performing the same functional role even though the image itself is different. Or you may have the same image that may be performing diverse functional roles within the overall organism or overall construct of the image. Uh, polyvalence, from the point of view of a rational logic, the object is a unit of measure. In other words, a frog's a frog's a frog. From the point of view of an image construct, the object is a nexus of qualities, each of which may or may not come into play depending upon the context in which it lies situated. Again, we're right back to what Wampold is saying, what is going on in um, psychotherapy, that it's contextually dependent. Correspondences, this is Antoine Favre, who's another esoterologist. And again, uh, Antoine Favre maps out these um, qualities of esoteric experience. Now, we're not going to get into a whole deconstruction of what, of what the esoteric kind of worldview is, but essentially, once we move in from the outer world to the inner world, what we begin to notice, it, and when we begin to look and examine at these images a little bit more closely, is that the, um, the connections that we observe seem purposive or observed to be purposive. This is, I'm um, just not going to repeat this, this is internal cohesion. Once again, Jung's pointing to this in that quote we saw before, which is repeated here, that essentially there's something in the image world, in the inner image world, that looks to cohere things into its own kind of internal construct. And here we began it in, in, um, in earnest. In olden times, when wishing still helped, there lived a king whose daughters were all beautiful, but the youngest was so beautiful that the sun itself, which had seen many things, was always filled with amazement each time it cast its rays upon her face. Here's the world we're looking at. There's the sun at the top there. It's presiding over the whole thing. It's the most elevated thing. It's looking down. There's the king. He's the next one down. There's the daughters, and then there's the subset of the youngest daughter. Now, what's interesting here is we have a kind of a vertical hierarchical structure with the sun image presiding over the kingdom, the king, who is, of course, a ruler, and so he represents really the rule of the situation, and then the daughters are there. And the youngest daughter, what is she? Well, she's the least adapted to the ways of the kingdom, and she's also the one with the most futurity. Already we're beginning to get into this polyvalence. Her young nature, her femininity, which is also going to factor into this in a very big way, all of these qualities necessitate that she be exactly what she is in the system. And we'll see how that pans out as we go along. We also notice what's missing in this kingdom. There's no mother mentioned. So the maternal is missing, and the maternal has the birthing quality. Of course, that quality might be down here with the daughters. It's certainly not up here in the upper half of this image with the king and the son, which are masculine elements. The son is referred to in a masculine. So we've got this kingdom divided between a masculine and feminine world. The daughters are down here below and again subdivided once again into the youngest daughter. And what's missing in this kingdom is any kind of procreative masculine or any inseminating element. So we have these two things really not in the picture. And what the story is pointing to in some way is that there's not going to be a heck of a lot of future in this kingdom. There's not going to be some birthing. No birthing is going to take place. It means there's not going to be any heir. 
there's not going to be any futurity to the kingdom. The kingdom's going to die off. And so this is the problem posed in the structure to begin with. Now, there was a great dark forest near the king's castle, and in this forest, beneath an old linden tree, was a well. Whenever the days were very hot, the king's daughter would go into this forest and sit down by the edge of the cool well. Okay, we've got some action going on. We have some teleology. We also have some structure happening. The day's hot. She's going down to the well. Okay, so she's moving. Uh, this is what we call commonly in physics entropy, the movement from heat down to coolness, the balancing of something that is excessively one way into something else. But it's propelling her out of the kingdom, out of the sphere up in the, um, uh, the kingdom realm, into another sphere. What do we have down here? We have woods and we have nature down here. Up here, we have the human world. This world up here is dominated by the masculine elements. What we're going to find out is that down here, the well is dominated by a feminine element. We don't know that yet. That comes more at the end of the story. But the youngest daughter, the least adapted to this world, the person least adapted to it, and the person with the most futurity, and a person, incidentally, that the story has told us that the highest principle has a really interesting connection to. There seems to be some important connection between the sun, which is the highest principle, and the lowest principle in the construct. What's this mean psychologically? Well, what it, what it points to is that uh, ruling elements in an individual do have some sort of connection of sorts with the most inferior aspect of the personality, so that these qualities in an individual are linked in some way. The daughter begins to leave the kingdom. She leaves that place because she needs to move out of the excessive solarity, the excessive heat and light of the kingdom. If she became bored, she would take her golden ball, throw it into the air, and catch it. More than anything, she loved playing with this ball. What does this mark her as? What does this tell us about her? Well, let's take a look, see if I have that diagram right here. Here we go, golden ball. Um, what is a golden ball? Well, a golden ball is a uh, perfection. It's a perfect sphere. It's golden, it's valuable. Uh, gold is valued by its purity. It's a perfect form, an ideal form. And it's more, more than anything else, it's an object. So what the story is telling us is that the youngest daughter's prized possession is a possession. In other words, she's focused on thingness. That's where she is at in, in her kind of consciousness. She's connected to the notion of thingness, objects, value, etc. and so forth. The golden ball, incidentally, is also connected to the sun in the sense that it's connected to fire with its purity and also heat. So these elements are involved with uh, the sun-like qualities. It's also sun-like in its form. So it's as if she's carrying down uh, to the well with her this um, um, a, a notion of uh, a perfection as a possession. One day it so happened that the ball did not fall back into the princess's little hands as she reached out to catch it. Instead, it bounced right over, right by her, and rolled straight into the water. The princess followed it with her eyes, but the ball disappeared and the well was very deep, so very deep that she could not see the bottom. Well, this is an interesting little conundrum. And any time we hear something like that, we wonder about the teleological process going on. So far, all the energy in this story has been uh, focused on a vertical axis and a descent. Everything's going down, 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 as if that we started with the lofty sun, and now we have to go down as far as we can. 
Now, the golden ball, of course, as the perfect object, has found kind of the perfect void. Uh, a well is a void. It's an empty space. So we see here this correspondence of the marriage, in a way, of this uh, inanimate ball, this thing which is her most precious possession. And it finds its way. Somehow it just, just happens. It just somehow happens that it finds its way into the well. Well, this is uh, kind of the way things happen in life as well. Um, uh, the individual who uh, is struggling hard to uh, find the, the perfect other uh, keeps finding people who uh, uh, let them down. Uh, the person who keeps trying to um, uh, find the most safe life and stable life finds unsafety and instability. That's kind of an interesting little conundrum that these things tend to find each other, but they do. And so what we're looking at in the image world here is that the perfect, the perfect object uh, finds a way of getting lost. It's as though she's lost that little talisman of perfection that she's holding on to. And here we have it, the ball falling down into the well. She began to cry, and she cried louder and louder, for there was nothing that could comfort her as she was grieving over her loss. A voice called to her, what's the matter, little princess? Your tears could move even a stone to pity. This is really important to take a look at, because suddenly affect has come into the situation, and as the affect has come into the situation, something else shows up. Uh, as Jung says, uh, nothing much is going to happen in the therapy without emotion. And of course, we see that as being a very uh, um, a common observation of psychotherapists, that once we begin getting down to the feelings, things begin to move. So here, the daughter has somehow found herself down by the well, somehow moved out of the kingdom, and just somehow or another, dropped the very thing of perfection. What she's really dropping is her own real worldview and the way she relates to things. That's what she's dropped. And when she's dropped that, that's been very painful for her, and it brings another piece of consciousness out of the well. She looked around to see where the voice was coming from and saw a frog sticking his thick, ugly head out of the water. Oh, it's you, you old water splasher, she said. I'm crying because my golden ball has fallen into the well. Be quiet and stop crying, the frog responded. I'm sure I can help you. But what will you give me if I fetch your plaything? Here we have the frog. Once again, frog from an outer perspective is a singularity. It's a frog. A frog is a frog is a frog. However, frog really is a collection of multiple qualities. And what we're going to understand here as we look at this and begin to think about this, that different aspects of these qualities really lend themselves to the solution of the tale, and others make it impossible. Of course, his cold-bloodedness, the fact that he's an amphibian, the fact that he's an animal, all make it a little bit difficult for her to embrace this frog. However, he's male. Frogs are known to be highly productive. He's relationship-seeking, as we will see. He's responsive. He's articulate. So we have these uh, qualities appearing in the frog. And we also have this other quality. He's a metamorph. Now, a metamorph is, of course, something that can change its form over time. What we're talking about is that the story itself, the context, necessitates a frog. It necessitates all these qualities. The context itself demands, in a way, that a frog appear. But we have a problem in the sense that the princess is on one side of the line of, of um, animal, of nature, and human, and the princess is on the other. So we have a problem. How are those two things going to eventually come together? Because that's what's needed. That's the teleology, or that's the thrust of the tale. But there's a problem here. There's an obstruction. Again, we see that the... Uh, uh, you know, she sees the frog as very slimy. That makes her recoil. In her observations, she touches the frog consciously wise in those qualities that make it impossible. However, the frog also has these other qualities 
that actually make him ideally suited to be a part of the picture. Whatever you like, dear frog, she said, my clothes, my pearls, my jewels, even the golden crown I'm wearing on my head. Well, here, the frog, um, excuse me, the, the princess, very much like maybe one of our patients, um, immediately thinks of a solution that's in terms of the kind of consciousness they're bearing. She wants to offer them all of her goods, all of her things. That's not what he wants. <laughs> His viewpoint is a little bit different. I don't want your clothes, your pearls and jewels, or your golden crown, the frog replied. But if you love me and let me be your companion and playmate, and let me sit beside you at the table, eat from your little plate, drink out of your little cup, and sleep in your little bed, if you promise me all that, I'll dive down and retrieve your golden ball. The frog's wanting relationship. And so he's representing something which is a piece of nature a natural form that is actually looking for connection with the human realm. Now, if we think about that psychologically, we can recognize that a part of our own nature might be seeking to be a part of our lives as well and enter into the human realm. If our conception of ourselves is as a closed system, uh, that, that our perfection is, a, uh, is an object that we possess rather than some perfection that we may perhaps be in, in relation to some sort of harmonious order of things, um, we are going to avoid that. I have a young man the other day who had um, uh, uh, has a lot of obsessive qualities trying to contain some somatic problems. He noted that when he flies into a rage, he busted his phone the other day, and when he breaks down and cries, he actually feels much better. And uh, I said, well, what happens when, when that, that comes upon you? And he says, well, I think I'm crazy and I should go to the hospital. Okay, so, you know, he's doing everything he can to hold that feeling world at bay in the same way that the princess is about to try to hold the frog at bay. And yet these feelings in some ways are seeking him. They're part of his reality and they're looking to be integrated into his life. And he does not want to allow that. And it was kind of a little breakthrough piece because he was able to stop and say, you know, I think that is what I have to deal with. I think I do have to deal with those feelings and I think I have to actually experience them because they're the only thing that seems to lead me to feeling a little bit better. So we have these paradigms, you see, where you have one form of consciousness, the existing form of consciousness, uh, where the ego looks at that as though it's its possession and then a piece of nature shows up. And a piece of nature really wants to be integrated. And that's something that we may not really want. Oh, yes, she said. I'll promise you anything you want, if only you'll bring back the ball. However, she thought, what nonsense that stupid frog talks. He can just sit in the water, croaking with the rest of the frogs. How can he expect a human being to accept him as a companion? Again, my patient, it's not acceptable to have these feelings. Well, it's eminently human to have the feelings he had. Um, but he doesn't see it that way. His perspective is like hers. I can't possibly accept this. Once the frog had her promise, he dipped his head under the water, dived downward, and soon came paddling back to the surface with the ball in his mouth. When he threw it onto the grass, the princess was so delighted to, to see her ball, her beautiful plaything again, that she picked it up and ran off with it. Well, again, here we are in this impasse between the external world of things and the internal world in which elements are related. She's got her little upper world where she's got her little perfect bowl, but the internal world is really wanting to connect. Uh, this is Nagel. So the proposal is that mental states would have a dual essence, phenomenological and physiological, but we still don't understand how this could be since our modal institutions go against it. That's the dilemma right there. I'm a princess, you're a frog, this can't happen. And that is the thing to be overcome. Lovely picture of her running off with the ball. And um, we have another similar uh, image, which I'll just spend a moment with. In our story, it's a frog coming up from the depths. In this story, which is the Christian story, the Immaculate Conception, it's the God coming down from above. And so the question is the kind of meeting of the two worlds. In this world, it's the descent of the divine element 
into the humanity and the virgin being the untouched, as yet untouched, procreative capability. In our tale, it's the princess who's the untouched procreative capability. But what's happening is a piece of nature is coming up from the depths as opposed to down from the heavens. But it's the same kind of structural paradigm in some ways. Wait, wait, cried the frog. Take me with you. I can't run like you. He croaked loudly as he could, but what good did it do? She paid no attention to him. Instead, she rushed home and soon forgot about the poor frog who had to climb back down in his well. The next day, as she sat at the table with the king and his courtiers and ate from her little golden plate, something came crawling, splish, 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 splash, up the marble steps. When it reached the top, it knocked at the door and cried out, Princess, youngest daughter, open up. She ran to see who was outside, but when she opened the door and saw the frog, she quickly slammed the door shut and went back to the table in a state of fright. The king could clearly see that her heart was thumping and said, my child, what are you afraid of? Is a giant come to get you? Well, indeed, uh, when my patient uh, that I was just mentioning about the feelings, when his feelings came up, he thought he should go to the psychiatric hospital. Well, he wasn't psychotic. He wasn't homicidal, but he just thought that his feelings were like a giant that had come to get him. And so this notion that a particular form of consciousness sees the other thing that is a piece of itself coming into relationship to it because it has that particular viewpoint, that particular consciousness, it sees that as a, human, a humongous threat. Oh no, she answered, it's not a giant, but a nasty frog. What does the frog want from you? Oh, dear father, yesterday when I was sitting and playing near the well in the forest, my golden ball fell into the water. She explains this to him. And the king then says, well, you know, you know you're going to have to go let him in. Okay. He keeps persisting. And these things will persist. Elements that are a part of us will persist. So when the patient is sitting there saying, talking about the thing they dread, and it keeps coming back, what we're thinking is, well, that's a part of you that's coming back. That piece is coming back to be unified with you. And the question is, can your particular consciousness actually let that in? What's actually going to happen is there's going to be a shift in consciousness that's going to have to happen. Um, we're getting a little slight on time here, so I'm going to have to run a bit. And um, at any rate, she lets the frog in. I think you know the story. Uh, she refuses to feed it, you know, and the frog and the king looks at her. It's really interesting, this uh, image of the king, because we can kind of analogize that to um, a kind of an ego that's capable of seeing what needs to really happen and set up a rule and say, well, uh, you know, I know I don't want to do this, but I really do need to do it. So it can really mediate that. Um, Finally, he said, I've, I've had enough and now I'm tired. Carry me upstairs to your room and get your silken bed ready so we can go to sleep. And here's what's going on. These two things are finally coming into contact. The princess with her golden possession. And it's interesting to think about this because the princess owns it as an object. And yet the frog is actually possessed by the well. He comes out of the void. He's been in an inner world. She's been in an outer world. So this is the outer things. These are the inner things. It's a little bit like the I Ching, actually, in that sense, which is so interesting. These people were brilliant. And we learn in a bit that what he's been captive by is a witch, which is really kind of an archetypal construct or a primordial one, just the way the sun is. The sun personified as masculine, the witch, which is down in the earth and keeping him down in the earth, personified as a feminine element. She, in a way, is the prisoner of the great solar masculine world, and he is the prisoner of the underworld. And the goal is for them to kind of find each other. Notice once again that all the action here has been on a vertical axis. It's all been on a hierarchical vertical axis. He is the most animated element of the nature world. 
Uh, the princess begin to cry. And of course, you know, the king says, you got to do this. And she does. So she picked up the frog with her two fingers. We can imagine this. Carried him upstairs and set him down in a corner. Soon after she had gotten into bed, he came crawling over to her and said, I'm tired and want to sleep as much as you do. Lift me up or I'll tell your father. <laughs> this made the princess extremely angry, and she picked him up and threw him against the wall with all her might. Now you can have your rest, you nasty frog. Not very princess-like, is that? However, when he fell to the ground, he was no longer a frog, but a prince with kind and beautiful eyes. So in keeping with her father's wishes, she accepted him as her dear companion and husband, whereupon the prince told her that a wicked witch had cast a spell over him, and no one could have gotten him out of the spell except her, and now he intended to take her to his kingdom the next day. What's happened here? Well, I think one of the ways to think about what's happened here is that some of the qualities have gotten inverted. The perfect princess has somehow or another taken into herself a rather animalistic nature. She's internalized that. And isn't it interesting that once she's internalized this animalistic nature, this instinct to survive and to kill off what it is she's threatened by, when she finally arcs out in that way, suddenly other aspects of the frog become visible as if her own denial of her animal nature landed on the frog and obscured from her view his incredible humanity, which now that she's taken it into her, this animal nature, she's actually able to see the humanity. Suddenly she sees him very differently. Well, think about this clinically. Your patient has all kinds of issues that make their life miserable. Is there not, though, perhaps another side to those elements, which is actually very helpful? Is the thing that's a problem also potentially a great asset? So depending on how it's situated in their life, that's what the tale is trying to help, help us to understand, that the situation of the qualities need to be switched around somehow in the inner world so that they're no longer what they were before. They're the same thing, but they're constructed differently. It's a different construct. They fell asleep. In the morning, we could spend time on the symbolism of this, the great white, the eight white horses, horses, ostrich plumes, harnessed with golden chains. Take a look at what's happening with the gold now. The gold, instead of being just some inanimate object and a toy and a plaything in perfection, services the process of pulling the human with the instinctual. The instinctual is driving the human. And which direction is the energy going now? It's not going on a vertical axis. It's going on a horizontal axis. It's going on a, on, a, on a plane on ground. It's become much more of a humanized union between the instinctual and the human on the plane of existence. So we've shifted from a vertical axis to a horizontal axis, axis and now we're moving in some direction. So now there's movement, and this is entirely different. Um, the issue of faithful Heinrich you know, the young king's servant, he had been so distressed when he learned that his master had been turned into a frog that he ordered three iron bands to be wrapped around his heart to keep it from bursting with grief and sadness. So what we see is that at the back of this whole uh, situation, the feeling function is now um, uh, in um, uh, a part of the whole process. We've got the feeling function, we've got the masculine and the feminine. We've got the futurity moving to a new place. We've got um, the, the reinstating of the, of the um, uh, instinctual and the feeling sense and the compassion, the relatedness, and so forth. All these things have been reorganized in the image construct to be a useful and purpose of um, um, uh, arrangement of things. And of course, uh, here they are. This is an illustration. Um, up here is a faithful Heinrich. Here's the horses, the gold chains are holding them together. And so we see the transformation of all those elements. But now the coach had come to bring the young king back to his kingdom. And faithful Heinrich helped the prince and the princess into it, then took his place at the back of it. 
He was overcome by joy because his master had been saved. They traveled some distance. The prince heard a cracking noise behind him as something had broken. He turned around and cried out, Heinrich, the coach is breaking. No, my lord, it's really nothing but the band around my heart. For it nearly fell apart when the witch did cast her spell and made you live as a frog in the well. The cracking noise was heard two more times along the way, and the prince thought each time that the coach was breaking, but the noise was only the sound of the band snapping from faithful Heinrich's heart, for he knew his master was safe and happy. In the end, uh, I apologize, I've, I've dragged this out uh, for the full time, but uh, I'm certainly around and can answer questions. Um, oh, I have 15 more minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, we can go back, actually, if you have questions. Uh, I can certainly make these diagrams available. I don't know that I um, have them available, but I can certainly have them printed out and, and have you get a copy of them. Is that right? The video will be available. Yeah, the video will be available. So you can go back. Uh, the question is, will these uh, diagrams be available? Um, yeah, you can go back and look at them again, because I believe you will have certainly access to this uh, uh, webinar. Yeah, and if you're comfortable, we can also turn them into handouts, and then we can email them to people. Sure, quickly. we can do that. We can uh, turn them into handouts and uh, um, you know email them to you. We can. That's not difficult to do if that would be useful for you. Um, I'm wondering if there's any you know questions or any um, uh, comments or observations. And quite clearly, there's just so much more in this that. Um, you know, we could go on for quite a good long while looking at each nuance. The um, commentary about the I Ching, about each little element of the story uh, or each little element of a situation, uh, um, um, each little element of the story fitting into the entire construct. One of the things I want to um, emphasize is that uh, pay attention to the nuance of your clinical cases because the nuances are intimately connected to the larger structure of what's going on. Uh, thank you for um, the comments. Um, certainly other questions or um, commentary, be happy to... Uh, Yeah, we can get, we can certainly get um, that to you, mm -hmm. those, uh, those slides. So you may want to ask if there's any other questions or discussion. We can also open up the microphone if they would like to speak or. Um... Yeah, we can certainly open up the microphone if you would like to speak. I can unmute you. We can talk a little bit. Or they can type in their questions. Yeah, or you can type in questions if you have them. Hoping this is useful to you and you might be able to, you know, use some of these notions that we've thrown out here to, to ground your work. Um, it's very different uh, to ground your work in the logic of the image than it is necessarily to ground your work in some sort of external structure. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Sorry for the silence. Uh, one of the things to remember is that um, uh, oh, there is a question here. You know, they came from several books. The question is, those images of the Frog King story are beautiful. Which book are they from? They came from several books. Um, they're online. You can look them up. If you look up the Frog King, they pop up all over the place. Um, there are some really nice ones. I just selected some that I thought went uh, well in um I uh, think on a number of the slides, there's the the name of the artist uh, that probably should be in there, but you know, time and and details, I kind of missed that. Yeah, it's also fascinating and so much to take in, but I can't think of any questions right now. Sure enough, I mean, I um, um you know, sometimes my um, Analytic uh, training cronies uh, uh, tell me that they need to come up for air sometimes when they're talking to me. So 
Um, I don't mean to barrage you, but I really did want to um, throw out those ideas to allow you to see that um, many very intelligent people are thinking about this material and um, that um, the way in which um, 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 the way in which the um, uh, psychological world as we know it is structured it really isn't quite getting to what is actually psychological. Uh, and here's a question. Can you say something about how a story comes to mind for your client? Or does the client come up with the story? Um, that, that's, that's fairly complicated. Let me, let me answer a, a couple of broad questions that I think are related to that, if I might. Um, I would say anything that's going on in the clinical, clinical situation is an image. Um, and the image itself is connected to a larger structure. Um, I had a woman who I was working with, with dreams, and we really just worked with her dreams for a long time. One day she came in and she was kind of excited. She was a little late getting in. And she'd been sitting in the waiting room and she um, said, you know, I was reading this really fascinating uh, story about um, sociopaths, you know, and so here's something that's just being introduced into the clinical situation that's somewhat incidental. Now, one might say, um, okay, well, that's just really interesting. So what? But I began to just work with it and just move with it. Uh, that woman last I know of was off at school um, um, getting a degree in forensic psychology. Um, and this was something that just kind of blossomed in the middle of the case. Um, what, what typically happens is that a patient in the course of my, my work with them, and it's different for different patients, sometimes I've got a guy that will just say, you know what, uh, I, just, I just have this image in my mind right now, and we just begin to work with it. You know, we just begin to pick it up and get curious about it. Um, other people will bring in stories. Another way to think about it is that when the patient comes in and says, you know, my husband's a jerk, I'll say, well, what did he do? And then, you know, the woman tells this entire story. We look at that as a psychological structure. So it isn't necessarily that a um, patient will bring a story per se, although um, the same gentleman who we talked about earlier with the, um, uh, the fear of feeling and feeling crazy, um, actually is an excellent writer, a very talented young man. Um, he doesn't write much, unfortunately. He had a dream where he had gotten lost and he had ended up in some woods and there was a depression in the woods and he couldn't get out of the depression. Then he finally got up out of it. And as he was fleeing the property, he was going by a house and there was an old woman there that offered him some cookies. And he didn't take the cookies because he was freaked out in the dream. And so I just asked him to go back and I said, well, you know, why don't you just write the story of that woman? And he did. And it was an amazing story. And there was just tons in it. So it's almost as if uh, something in the patient wants to come to the surface. And if you take the attitude of welcoming it forward, it will begin to articulate itself. It'll begin to tell its own story. So in that last case, he had the narrative in the dream, and I just asked him to move with that narrative. But I would say that any instance of image, whether it's a narrative, whether it's a dramatic enactment, whether it's an intrusive fantasy, uh, did I say dream, whether it's a dream, um, uh, sometimes, you know, if a symptom comes up, you know, we just, I just asked the patient to imagine the symptom and his relationship to it or her relationship to it and what that looks like, or we could actually get them to draw those things so that any way that we can move it from the notion of the world of things to the uh, dynamic world of images in which we're really looking at it differently. We're really looking at how those elements come together and how they speak to one another. Um, that's what I go for. I hope that answers the question. Um, some some 
patients have brought in stories. In fact, uh, with little girls, uh, there's a little girl that I saw who had some autistic stuff. And what we did was she had these little figures and we made a, a scene for the figures and she put the figures in there and we told a story and took photographs, just a lot of great working through of stuff. Yeah. So it's all over the board. I hope I hope that, that that's not too unclear. Um, uh, it says here, a situation that I recently experienced when working with a group of children at a hospital came to mind when we were working with kinetic sand and one of the children formed a golden ball so firm that it seemed hard to break. Yet when he stuck a wooden stick into the ball, it broke apart in a second. Even if this might not be directly associated with the story, it nevertheless symbolized the smooth external surface of the integral fragility of the boy's psychological world. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. You know, there's a there's a, um, I want to say two things to that. One is that I'm not in favor of taking a, a story and saying the story tells this particular person's case. Um, but it does happen that when a patient's sitting with me, automatically I think of a poem, I think of a story. And this is the way psychological space works, because what's happening there in your situation, Elke, is that the, um, um, the, 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 the patient's material is triggering something in you. And as you're looking at the story, you're brought back to that. That's the correspondence that I'm talking about. And so it's beginning to unify your consciousness with them. And um, um, uh, Hans George Gadamer, a philosopher who dealt a lot with art, said that the nature of art is really just that, to actually affect us in a, in a, in a way. So that images appear in our imagination as well that help us or, or, or images appear that come from stories and myths and poems and so forth that actually help us to encapsulate or illuminate the experience we're having of the patient and gain insight into it. So I love what you write there. I think that that's, that's, that's right on from my perspective. Yeah, any more questions? I'm having fun. <laughs> Great stuff. So what, if you have questions you want to type in, um, I can go over just a couple other little uh, housekeeping items. I emailed you some evaluations. Um, if you could take a moment to fill out your evaluations, hopefully you've already filled out your pre-test. Um, if you could give us some feedback about the program, things that you'd like to see us uh, improve or things that you would like us to speak about into the future. Uh, and also to fill out any post tests that you may have. Uh, we will be rendering this video and uploading it, and I will be emailing you once again with the links for the recorded version so you can have access to that. Um, if you are joining late or are going to be principally watching this again through a recorded version, there is another evaluation or sort of, I think it's just about eight questions or something in terms of an examination to fill out. Um, again, these are really just to, in order for us to keep our accreditation process for continuing education credits. Um, I will be also sending out uh, evaluations or certificates of completion when you return your evaluations to me. Um, and again, you can do that at contact at psychearts.org. And uh, do please check out our website at psychearts.org for new and updated courses that we'll be offering both online and in person. We have a lineup that we'll be rolling out shortly. And uh, we hope that you'll be able to join us. So are there any other questions? Uh, here's one more. Um, Comment. It says, wonderful webinar. Thank you so much, Mark and Michelle. I look forward to the next session. Well, we look forward to having you uh, participate. It's great that you could uh, participate. We really appreciate it and enjoy it. And uh, thank you all for staying up uh, so late. I know some of you are overseas and uh, uh, that um, 
you're staying up very, very late. So. Or some of them are just getting up first thing in the morning, or um, this is actually occurring in the middle of the night for some. Yeah. So we really appreciate um, the diversity of our audience, and uh, we really appreciate that you've uh, made the time and investment to join us. And uh, many of you are signed up for our next webinar next month uh, in this series, which is, oh goodness, I think it's the Persephone or the Echo and Narcissus um, webinar, uh, which too will also be available as a, a video afterwards. So if there are no more questions, oh, here's another one. Here's another question. The medical model is so prevalent. How does one introduce all these alternative ways of looking at the psyche? Well, um, that's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> um, uh, that's part of the impulse to do something like this, is to begin to set the record straight a little bit. Um, the medical model is its own construct, and it is confluent in many ways with the nature of the society in which it's embedded. So in that sense, it's a little bit, um, shares a similar relationship, maybe let's say analogous to um, uh, Christianity during the 1400s and 1500s, that a belief system and a worldview kind of go together. And so we live in a very rationalistic society. Um, the principles of the enlightenment that came out of the 1700s primarily have formed really modern society in many ways. And so a modernist and materialist kind of vision of the human psyche is uh, in a way kind of a mythic construct that fits with that. It really does take a lot of education. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm involved with this is that as I begin to look at psychological phenomena with my patients, it looked in no way <laughs> like what I was taught that it would look. And in fact, um, it looked uh, almost diametrically differently than that. So uh, once you begin to get into and get informed about the nature of human consciousness, once you begin to understand the relationship between an observational stance and the phenomena observed, and once you begin really paying attention to psychological phenomena, you realize that you, you actually really do need multiple viewpoints to be able to understand this material. Wampold's research is excellent for doing that. He's done some really good work in, in breaking the ice and opening that up. But part of the reality just is that the, um, the role of economics and psychology and the need of society for systemic and mass production sort of psychotherapies is very, very powerful. And uh, so there's economics in there, there's a belief system in there. And I think what you have to do is to uh, try to speak up about it and try to present um, um, the other point of view because it is compelling once you actually have some clinical experience and you, and you run into these uh, issues and run into these phenomena, you really begin looking for different ways to kind of hold and express those. That's what myths are for. And that's why the early uh, psychological explorers were really myth makers. Freud and Jung were constructing mythic constructs, not false constructs, because a myth's not a falsehood. It's, it's a construct, a fictive construct that holds a reality. So it's very, very uh, difficult to do. Um, the college system, the academic system is really uh, populated really with scientists who have by and large no clinical practice in many cases. So you really have a serious problem because people are being educated into that model and you have an economic system that promotes that model. And so this is what the population get educated into. I do have to say, on the other hand, however, that my patients don't have a problem understanding it. And many of them are relieved <laughs> that somebody's actually stopping and believing that their individual life is a reality unto itself that has a certain kind of sense that it makes, and somebody's going to bother to try to understand that. So I don't have a lot of. Um, um, huge hope that the world's going to change. 
But I do, um, and Wampold mentions this problem too. He says that essentially the medical model is going to suffocate psychology. It's going to suffocate psychotherapy. And it tends to want to do that. Um, there are people that practice in that vein, and I'm not saying that they're bad practitioners. They're operating in a construct that in itself can be very beneficial. However, I don't think it's beneficial because it's actually medical. I think it's beneficial because those people believe in it, and it kind of makes sense with some of their patients that also see things that way. And so it's not necessarily uh, wrong in that sense. But I think the problem is it's not more right. I think that's what we would say. And in fact, the reason that it works when it works is not because it's scientifically correct or factually correct, but because it conforms to a certain sort of model of thought or model of conceptualization that is kind of a syntonic or synonymous with the way the culture sees it. So that's a tough one. You know, that's a real tough one. Okay. So I think we are out of time. Again, thank you so much for being a part of our program. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email us. Again, contact um, at psychearts.org. Psychearts is spelled P-S-Y-C-H-E-A-R-T-S dot org. And uh, we'll be in touch shortly in terms of our next program. So thank you again. And I look forward to speaking and seeing you soon.